Mr. Ambassador, today I am your hype lady, and Chimamanda, I am your hype lady today. Please give it up for our illustrious guests, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. I had the pleasure of traveling to um, France with Vice President Harris late last year. Um, so I can say that I'm no stranger to the hospitality of the French people. And I'm very excited to be here tonight with you in conversation. For the folks who are watching on the Twitters and Facebook, thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us. We are going to have a conversation tonight. And then we're going to take some questions from the audience. We are unmasked because we have been tested. We are negative. Everyone here has been tested. We have adhered to COVID protocols. And we're just, I'm just so excited. Chimamanda and I had an opportunity to connect prior to uh, coming out here. And I, I did say, Mr. Ambassador, I said, do they know that what they have gotten themselves into having this conversation with the two of us during Black History Month, nonetheless? <laughs> so with that, let's just, let's just get into it. Welcome. Thank you, Simone. Um, and I'm just really happy to be doing this with you. I, uh, I want to start by saying that I've always felt that she's an absolute star. And um, watching her on television has always, for me, meant something. Because I think that the way that she occupies space in the world and her red lipstick and her hair, <laughs> since this is Black History Month, let's start with that. Um, are really important, and we should talk about hair, right? We because should talk I, about hair, yes. Because I, just watching you, I, I would often think, I'm so glad that this woman exists and is visible. Thank you. I'm glad mm. you exist. We, we discussed this a little bit um, when we chatted earlier, but I feel like I see myself a lot in what you have written and what you have said, from your words on feminism to your interviews, and we talk about hair, and you did an interview with the Baltimore Sun, a little while ago, it was a profile of you, and in the profile you told a story, and that you have a daughter, a beautiful, beautiful baby girl, not so much a baby anymore though. Six. She's six. six years old, shout out to all the parents with six years old in the room and on the Zooms. And that your sister said, oh my goodness, I need to send you some metal comb so you can corral her hair, would you like me to do that? I'm paraphrasing, but you told her no. And I found that so powerful, and you said that Basically, this is what your daughter's hair looks like, and you're not going to conform to what people believe it should look like. And I see myself in that so much. I look like this intentionally. I'm not light-skinned, skinny with long hair. I'm a bald, curvy black woman with bedazzled nails. <laughs> and I love it. <laughs> so talk, let's talk about this. People talk about the idea of identity, but what we're talking about is being your authentic self. And you have a lot of philosophies. So tonight we're going to get into Chimamanda's philosophies. And one of your philosophies is about, I would argue, authenticity. You yes. write about it. Yes. You live it. Okay, fabulous authenticity. Talk to me a little bit about that. Well, you know, first about my daughter. Um, <laughs> she's six and perfect. Um, she's a fierce little thing. And I'm terrified of her in many ways. <laughs> but, uh, but I think this is a good thing. <laughs> And, you know, for a long time, and even now, I mean, and, and also I think for us as Nigerians, there's a kind of, um, I think there's a kind of immigrant anxiety hmm. about, and I think also I'm going to say there's also a kind of black anxiety about looking perfect. Mm -hmm. The hair has to be perfect because if you're black and you're a bit, you know, your hair looks a bit rough, you're going to be judged in a way that's very different from if you're white and your hair looks a bit rough, you know, so. Yeah, the messy bun hits different when you are yes. melanated. But I, I also just felt that I, because when I was growing up, I had so much, um, I had a lot of hair and I, I just had the most horrible time having my hair done. Mm -hmm. And I have not forgotten just the, the pain of it. Mm -hmm. And so I said, my daughter is not going to go through that. So from the time she was really young, Actually, I didn't comb her hair until she was maybe four. Four. So, yep. I would finger detangle. And whatever that did, we, we, we were happy with. Right? I didn't need it to be perfectly done. Or, and so, you know, and my mother, um, my mother um, died recently, but, but my mother had very firm ideas about how hair should be. So she'd be like, aren't you going to do something about her hair? And I would say, I've already done something about her hair. <laughs> that's, that's it. And she's six. And I think now she, she, doesn't, she will not have the memories that I have mm -hmm. of hair being associated with pain. 
um, and also trying to force your hair to do something that God did not intend for it to do. I just, you know, I just don't see the point. But, but I think in a larger sense, my, um, I just think that life is so short um, and we're here so briefly and mm -hmm. so fleetingly that I don't see the point in not being who we really are. Mm. Because if we're here for such a short time, we might as well just be who we are. And when I talk to particularly young women, I like to say to them, and I think, and I say this because obviously I think men also have, um, I guess men have issues, I guess. But um, no, 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 more seriously. We'll, we'll get to you in a second, fellas. We'll, we'll maybe, get to you in maybe, a second. Maybe. We have something for you here as well. Maybe. But, but when I say, because I think that young women, there's a lot of pressure. Mm -hmm. And this pressure to conform, this pressure to be likable, this pressure to, and I say to them, you know what? Somebody will like you the way you are. And if you're going to be a self that's not true to you so that people like you, they don't actually like you. Right. They just like this invented persona. And, and, and for me personally, I've just always felt the most at peace when I'm, me and I'm very willing to um, like I like to be liked. I don't. Don't need, we all? Yeah. I mean, it's a natural feeling. Everybody yeah. wants to be it's liked. It's human. Yes. That desire, but what is not human, and I think what is socially constructed, is this idea that we need to be liked. And I think women are taught that. Mm. And I, I did not get that memo, so I, I do not need to be liked. And I think that that there's a difference there because if you free yourself from that need to be liked, then, then you can be who you are. Hmm. And the people who like you will like you for the real person that you are. Yeah. I agree. I think the question is, I talk, uh, I, I think the question is how, right? Because yeah. people say, oh, okay, you tell people, let's be authentic selves. Yeah. But how does someone who, you know, isn't as comfortable with themselves as you or myself are, like, yeah. you know, we don't care. Yeah. We care, but we, we don't. Care. We care, but we don't care. Yeah, we're comfortable yes. with not caring. Um, but what about the people? How does someone free themselves from that idea and that thought? Young women, especially, but I also think it applies to people in general. Yeah, you know, I wish I knew. I would sell it. You know, <laughs> put worth it a billion dollars. A okay, but I, but I, <laughs> you know, I think it, maybe it's what is the thing that is least exhausting. And but I should also say, obviously, it's easy to say, right? And and I think it's a journey. I think it's something that one does. Um, it's a practice, I think. So I know, for example, that there are times when I, I have to talk to myself and say to myself, no, mm. right? You're, you're, you're kind of thinking you should do that because it's considered more mainstream or more, but no, because you're not going to sleep well at night and you're going to wake up and you're not going to like yourself. So no. So I think it's the constant, um, it's a practice. And in general, I would say to young women, what is the thing that makes you not feel exhausted? Mm. Because performing is exhausting, mm. right? And, and there's something quite freeing, I think, when you get to that point where, and it's not that you don't care, because I, you know, I, I often don't, I think it can be too glib to say, oh, I don't care. We, like you said, we care, I care. I, I like being liked. But I think, again, it's that distinction. If you say to yourself, it's lovely to be liked, I would like to be liked. But if I need to change myself to be liked, then they don't really like me. Mm. And, and it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, I think it's a, um, a practice. And I think also, I would say to, to, to young women, you know, get off social media a bit. Let's talk about social media. Because, okay? no, and, I, and I say that because, yes. you know, all of these studies that show what it does to teenage girls... Um, how the, the more time they spend on Instagram, I think in particular Instagram. You can get particular, yes. The, 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 it's the truth. Did y'all read the study? They're laughing. They're like, can we? It's it true, is though. the truth. There is a study, and the study particularly signaled, signaled out Instagram yes. and the detrimental effects it has on young women, young yes. girls across the board, yes. teenagers yes. who spend time on that platform. Yes. Um, and, I mean, we we can take this conversation and get into the details about suicides, particularly yeah. over the last two years, yeah. not just as it relates to the pandemic, but everyone who have been, who as a society, we've been more online and our young people yeah. have been more online. So, so we giggle, but it's true. Instagram is a problem. So I would say, you know, I mean, and I wouldn't say, I, I don't want to sound like sort of that old cantankerous uncle that says everything modern is terrible, even though in some ways I think that, but, but I would say just step back a bit. Right. So I was talking to some women 
in Nigeria, I, was, I, I just came back from Lagos and I said to them, if you do five hours every day, just try and do two and let's see how that goes. And the three hours left, read a damn book, <laughs> like a proper book, because people don't read. Hmm. But I, I won't go into a rant about that because that's <laughs> like my... I think that, no, I think this is really important though, especially mm -hmm. the conversation around social media. Mm -hmm. You talk about, you just came back from Lagos, you know, Twitter actually was banned in Nigeria yep. until recently. Mm -hmm. They banned Twitter, they banned the use of Twitter. What, for folks that don't know, why, why did that happen? Or what is, your, what is your philosophy or thought about why Twitter was banned? Twitter was banned because we have a government that is um, inept. That's why, that's the short answer. The long answer is... <laughs> We don't have enough time. We don't have enough time. But, but it was banned just by just the government. The but, but I should say that while I think that social media is bad for young women in general, young people actually, I think, when it comes to political issues in parts of the world that don't necessarily have real thriving democracies mm -hmm. like Nigeria, I think Twitter is a good thing mm -hmm. because I think it gives young people a voice. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that the government felt so threatened by Twitter to ban it, I thought was a good sign mm -hmm. because young people are organizing on Twitter because um, recently we had this NSARS um, sort of movement, really is what it is, of young people. And it was organized online. It was Twitter. So, so it's kind of that thing where it's not that Twitter is all bad and all terrible. It has its uses. It has its uses. People, young people are organizing yep. across. I mean, they're organizing in Nigeria. They're organizing here in the in the states. And you have written, honestly, you've written a little bit of everything. Okay, <laughs> we've written on. We'll talk about it a little bit. But you've written about grief. You've written about yeah. feminism. You've written about race. You've written about uh, race in the context of identity. You've written yeah. about young uh, young Nigerian women, young Nigerian people. You've written about engaging in various cultures. You've also written about democracy, though. You've, written about, you've written about it all. So <laughs> let's talk about your philosophy, if you will, on democracy. And wow. especially in a time where here in the United States, and I also argue globally, right, the, um, the Biden-Harris administration, they recently had, a, at the end of last year, a summit on democracy. And countries and heads of states all around the world participated. President Macron participated. President Buhari from Nigeria, he participated. Yes, he participated in the Summit on Democracy, honey. And the, the point is <laughs> that, as I have heard President Biden say on a number of occasions, that democracy, we're in a point where folks have to prove if democracies can work because democracies around the world are being questioned. Mm. And here in the United States of America, you hear almost regularly on television now, uh, it's popping up in writings almost regularly about the threat to democracy. Mm. And I wonder if you, if you feel that there is a real threat to democracy here in the United States and, and around the world. Yes, um, but I should say that I felt it more strongly with the former American president. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, 45, yes. Um, Yes, that person, for reasons that I think are fairly obvious. I mean, um, and just reading recently about, you know, this idea of sort of inventing um, stories to justify wanting to carry out a coup. Mm. Um, now, do for folks at home and in the room that don't know what uh, my good friend here is speaking about, there were reports from the Washington Post that said the former president uh, and his administration and people who are aligned with the former president's administration essentially wanted to justify something they call the sweep, which uh, my colleague Ari Melber called a coup. That's what it is. And, we should use the right yes. language. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because the, the, one of the problems, I think, with this country, you know, and I, and I love America, is there's often a tentative sort of an unwillingness to call things what they are. Mm. You know, when, when the former president first became president and was lying, I remember there was so much discourse around, should you call it a lie? Yes, and I, I lived that discourse. It was right? crazy. And I thought, yes, it's a lie. You call it a lie when it's a lie. It doesn't depend on who's doing the lying. It depends on whether it's a lie or not. And I, and I think what's, what's happening again around this discourse about, about the elections, I, I feel as though there isn't a, I don't, I was going to say, I was going to go into a rant about the failures of the left, but yeah, I feel like there isn't enough force of pushing back and creating a counter narrative, which actually is the truth. Um, so yes, I think it's a coup. 
you know, you, there is no evidence of um, any kind of voter fraud or any kind of, you know, where people, where, I mean, just basic sort of kindergarten level understanding of things. And like, oh, look, we were watching it and initially the Republicans were up and then suddenly they weren't. Yes, that's because all the votes hadn't been counted. Yeah, I mean, yes, the these are the bad. Yeah, there's just elementary level understanding. And so anyway, yes, back to your question, um, just so I don't get derailed into a rant. But um, yes, I think democracy, I mean, obviously, just looking at Europe, um, but also in the US. So, so I think thinking about countries like Hungary, you know, you, or, or even Poland, I'm just like, what is going on? And I'm a little obsessed with the Second World War, so I read a lot about that period. Are we going to see you writing about that again anytime soon? Are we going to see a, a book about democracy, something anchored in democracy? No. <laughs> Way to dash the dreams. <laughs> no, just writing a nice love story. Because I'm, you know, I'm done. I'm done with, no, I'm kidding. But everything is about, but think about it though. I think everything in the end is political. So, yes. So yes. I say that argue, again, because I don't want anybody to miss that because it is inherently true. It's true. It's true. Everything is political. So, um, so my novel Americana, for example, which, you know, in many ways is an immigrant story. It's a love story, but also it's very political. Mm -hmm. And and in ways that are both um, overt and not. So, you know, obviously in the book I write about Obama, it's, 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 there's a scene at, at um, you know, the evening when Obama won. Um, but also just in a larger sense, it's about, it's political. Everything is political. In this country, obviously, um, because I'm politically left-leaning, I was very relieved when the former president um, was not re-elected. <laughs> it seems to me that grown-ups are now in charge in this country, and so it gives me a bit of hope. But I think that just watching American politics, if, if people who have been voted into power can say that attacking the seat of government is legitimate political discourse, mm. that's very undemocratic. So that, if anything, is proof that something is really wrong in this country. And I kind of feel like we need, we need a revolution. People who are reasonable, who believe in science, <laughs> um, and who are willing to have conversations with the other side, you know, the reasonable other side, need to rise up because yes, democracy is in peril in this country, in many parts of the world. Let's not even go into Nigeria because I would not even call it a democracy, what we have. And I say that so not to That's be a strong statement. No, it's a, but it's true. It's true. You cannot have a democracy where, um, journal, you know, you have a government that routinely ignores court orders. If you don't, if you just, I mean, the fundamental basis of a democracy is that there should be rule of law. I mean, we should all collectively agree that if a court says, for example, you cannot arrest this man, you need to let him go, you do that. We have a president who just, he just shrugs. Mm. It's like, nope, not doing it. There are Journalists elections. are arrested. You know, so, so yes, it's not, I'm not saying it to be flippant. I'm saying it because I mm -hmm. believe it. It's not, we do not have a real democracy, no. So one of the, there are, um, obviously, there's this conversation happening globally. This is a global challenge yeah. that many countries are dealing with. And again, President Biden has talked about it a lot. You know, can, demo people are wondering, or say, not even wondering, saying that democracies are dead, that they can't work anymore. And the fundamental question, um, some people would argue of a democracy and then getting people to, to trust the government again is, yeah. can governments work for the people? Can they make a difference in the people's lives? And elections are a key part of that, can, can yeah. carry out free and fair elections. And I know there's elections in Nigeria in 2023, so we'll be watching. Uh, and I think the world will be watching and that is a, a, a topic of Bless conversation. <laughs> Okay, I want to talk about, I want to switch. We're okay, going you to know, get but we should also say, I mean, and, and yes, the, I think President Biden's question is valid, but, but I think also we cannot separate that from how much money. I mean, I, I think the problem with the politics in this country is that it is so intertwined and infused with money. Oh, yeah, yeah. The like, entire apparatus, Democrats, yes. Republicans. In the, I mean, it is, uh, I, used to, I used to work for a lot of people. I used to work for Senator Bernie Sanders. When he first ran for president, I was yeah. his press secretary, and um, the it, Bernie Sanders belief boiled down to, and in that campaign, it boiled down to that we lived in a rigged democracy kept in place by a system of corrupt campaign finance. So, because we live in a rigged democracy, 
we need to do this kept in place by system of corrupt campaign finance. We have to do this on racial justice. We have to do this on the economy. We have to do this on voting. We have to do this on, you know, go down the line. Mm -hmm. And I think there are a lot of people in the country that that do feel that way. Yeah. That feel like and live the real experience of the gross inequality yeah. that we're just experiencing yeah. daily. And if you're a young, bright person who wants to, and I think that America is full of young, bright people who would do very well in political office, but how to get in? And then it just becomes about fundraising. And mm -hmm. I, was, I remember I've read a few sort of memoirs and things about people who've been, and I just think, my God, the amount of time spent on phone calls pretty much begging people for money is kind of disgusting. So what, I mean, well, anyway, I mean, I have some suggestions. So what if sort of, <laughs> all right, let's move on. No, I love it. I mean, this, this, this is in, this finds its way though into Americana. It does, like yeah. the, the idea <laughs> of gross inequality. There's a scene in the book where, um, I feel like they're in Nigeria, they're in Lagos, and young people, young popping black Nigerians, okay, going to a party, and you can tell the folks who are just very well dressed, and they've got the logos and everything on, but Nigeria is a country much like other countries who are experiencing gross inequality, yeah. and I think this is just another way that issues of democracy and politics find its way yeah. into your writing, your yeah. philosophy was there on the pages. Yeah. And, you know, I'm just, it's so funny because, you know, just you talking about democracy has made me think about how, you know, what you said about trust and can it work for people? I think it can. Mm -hmm. I don't think democracy is a perfect system. It's no. the best we have, yeah. I think. It can work for people, but I think in many ways it's not. So maybe that's also why we're in the, where we are. Because, you know, we, we can sit here and bemoan the former president, but he had many supporters, still has many supporters, um, for ideas that I think are close to, I don't want to use that word fascist, it's overdone in this country, because I'm like, you people really need to go see what real fascism was. But, but that's actually undemocratic, right? And so you can, and you look at countries like Poland and Hungary, and, and even France has a, a thriving um, undemocratic side. The ambassador about to come pull the plug on this thing. <laughs> but I think for me, the question we should be asking is why, you know, what's the basis for the support? Mm -hmm. So clearly, maybe the, the ways in which democracy is failing us, maybe in this country, the way that politics works and lobbying and how it's just so much about money and how I think America is a good country that could be so much better. And you know, people do not have to worry about go going to see a doctor in a country like America because they don't have health insurance. Right? People, um, health insurance should not be tied to employment in this country, I don't think. Um, funding for schools should not be tied to property taxes. I think it's terrible, right? So, so you have... Uh... Well, I mean, you're, what you're talking about is constantly striving for a more perfect <laughs> union. So that's where you get things mm -hmm. like the Affordable Care Act and so on and so forth for people who do not have employment but are yeah. able to and even if you do have employment you can sign up in the exchange but i think you're 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 making a very i mean we could we could have this particular conversation all day long you know i can okay i want to pull up something before we take some crowd questions i have some other because i want to i want to talk about cancel culture but before we get there okay you said and you're like where did i say this don't worry <laughs> i'll tell you in an interview and you talked about, and I'm looking for the, the, the actual, here we go. You talk about ideological purity. And you have said previously that ideological purity is dangerous and it is becoming the lens through which, through which many approach storytelling in America. Mm, somebody said, mm, yes, deep. Talk to us about that. Talk to us about ideological purity. And let me say off the bat that I agree with you. I think, I think ideological purity is dangerous and I think it's kind of crazy. And I'll use the example of people talk a lot about, um, and you, you use this in your quote. You said, um, people say Trumpism is not us, and you can't really unpack what is happening if you are not willing to see, and I'm paraphrasing, but basically see folks who subscribe to Trumpism, for example, and we can insert any other different word for Trumpism as full people. And I think that that is so profound. You know, I have people in my family very close to me who voted for the former president. Um, and people are like, what, you? Yes, me, and they're black, okay? <laughs> so the idea that everyone who supports X is 
for in a very simplistic term, as I have heard some people describe, not smart or not politically tuned in or white or racist is wrong. The idea that everyone who self-describes as a feminist is, as I've heard you say before, a bra burning, no makeup wearing, like fashion hating, you know, lady is, is not true. It's crazy. So talk to us. Let's unpack the idea of ideological purity. Uh, um... And God bless you too. I mean, I, I just cannot imagine what it's like to do what you do. But anyway, um, it was stressful. I, no, I'm sure it was because I think, I think, and I not not to sound. Um, I mean, I, I I hope this doesn't come across as sort of being condescending, but I do think that there's something about the level of political discourse in this country that has really gone down. Mm. And so I came here when I, I first came to the US when I was uh, 19, I came to go to college and I've always been interested in politics. So I would sort of follow things. And I feel as though in that time, I'm now 44, I feel as though the discourse has really gone down. And part of it, I think, is this idea of ideological purity. It seems to me that there isn't nuance, there isn't um, even reality. So. Simone, you're a Democrat, but yesterday you had dinner with a Republican, therefore you're bad. I mean, I'm simplifying it, but fundamentally it kind of is that. Um, so you voted for something that supported climate change, but you didn't vote for something that supported, uh, I don't know, um, uh, I'm thinking of Women's something. rights. Women's rights. Therefore we cannot talk to you. And, you're, and, and also the moralizing of discourse, you know, so, so it's not so much I don't agree with the position you've taken, it's that you're bad, like you're a bad person. And I just think it's very unrealistic. Human beings are not perfect. Mm -hmm. And I think because I come from a, a storytelling perspective and because I, I really believe in literature, I really believe in reading human stories, I really believe in humans as, you know, we're very complex and complicated. I'm not ideologically pure. There are times when I have made choices that did not necessarily align with the things I believe ideologically because I'm human and I'm messed up in the way that human beings are. And I think if we took a much more realistic approach to politics, maybe we would get things done more, maybe. But I don't even know whether it's too late because you know, I sort of feel like now in America, if somebody on the right says that glass of water is half full, the person on the left then feels compelled to say it's empty. And, at the, and, and by the way, Neither is true, but, but it's about this sort of, we, the narratives have to compete because we, I don't know, there's just this. I, so we need more nuance in storytelling in America, you believe? In everything. Mm. Not, I mean, I don't mean just literature, I mean in political life, in, um, because we need to start off with the assumption that there is no such thing as ideological purity. It doesn't make sense, right? It just doesn't. And th I feel like that's not, I feel like that's what my six-year-old should be doing, not adults, you know? I agree, I agree. So, but this then, okay, no ideological purity. We're on the same page there. And I think a lot of people, even though they subscribe and yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll use the term traffic in ideological purity, once it being unpacked and I think really having a conversation about it, I think a lot of folks actually would agree with you. But let's talk about cancel culture mm. because I feel like the conversation about ideological purity and cancel culture are in the same yeah. Bucket. They, they're, they're swimming in the same stream, yeah, okay, yeah, as, my, yeah. as my grandmother would say. And I, str I'm just talk about myself personally. I struggle with the idea of people saying, oh, well, we shouldn't cancel people. Because on one hand, I agree, because I just said there's no such thing I agree with you about ideological yeah. purity. Yeah. But on another hand, should there not be consequences for the positions and the stances and the beliefs that people have and that they articulate? Yeah. So I, I don't think it's, I, I think there's a, um, a middle ground in a way. Some nuance? So, Dare we yeah, say well. nuance? <laughs> so obviously I think that there, there should be consequences to things. But I think maybe the question is, um, and I don't even like that expression cancel culture because. I know you've said it you've yeah. in an interview. She's got a lot of interviews. Yeah, I should probably, it's maybe time to stop. But I, I think that it's just been co-opted by sort of Fox News and it's become this thing that, um, again, lacks nuance. You know, people just say cancel culture, cancel culture. But I do think that it refers to something real that is happening, which is, and it's, it's kind of all connected to ideological purity. It's that idea that we cannot, um, that, the, that 
the assumption of good faith mm -hmm. is dead. So if you said something to me now, um, the, the, the general idea is that I should take the most sort of negative interpretation of what you've said. I think what that leads to is a kind of, um, so people should face consequences, but there should be a sense of, um, I mean, there should be a sense of proportion. So for me, it's a question of, so I'll tell you a story. I remember somebody saying to me once um, that she was very disappointed. And even that is just the most annoying thing where, people, where you're told, people tell you they're disappointed in you for liking what you like. It is such nonsense. But anyway, so this woman had said to me that she was disappointed in me because I had written about liking Philip Roth's novels. Now, Philip Roth I think, and maintain, was a great novelist. He was also, I think, a lot of his work was misogynistic. He just did not know how to create female characters that were people. They were types. And so this person said, how can you be a feminist and like his work? And I thought, well, I do. Because A, I recognize the misogyny, and I don't like it, obviously. But I also recognize that the world is full of misogynists. And um, we, we can't wish that away. So he wrote about that. And also for me, it's, so I like Philip Roth, but there are certain writers I do not like. There are writers that I, I think are racist. I will not buy their books. I will not read them. I mean, I've read them to know that they're racist. I won't read anything else. <laughs> um, I, won't, I won't write about them. So, so I draw my line somewhere. And when I say racist, I mean really racist. I don't mean that the, the char there's a character in the book that maybe says the N-word, because I think we need to look at things in a holistic sense. There are books in which a character can say the N-word, but you know that the worldview of that book is not racist. And there are books in which you read, and it might not be the N-word at all, but you know that that book is racist because the worldview of it is racist. So I think maybe for me, it's a question of both proportion and a kind of, um, we have to approach these things with, with thoughtfulness, you know, you can destroy people. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you really can destroy people in this sort of, or oh, face consequences. Then next thing you know, they're putting up people's um, addresses online and there are real consequences to it, I think. You know, you, you don't know who's going to go into major depression. You don't know whose child is going to be negatively affected for life. So I just think that we, you know, I think it's that thing between the Philip Roth novel and the racist novel. Like we, we, th there should be proportion. There should be some nuance. There should be some nuance. And I, I just worry that, that there isn't really, um, n not much, not anymore. Not and much. social media contributes to it because, because you know, Twitter is about, about how extreme can you get, you know, how, how clever and how quick. And so it's not a, a forum that lends itself to nuance. And so usually what it means then, and everybody's kind of performing, you know, we're, we're all in many ways performers. <laughs> Every day, I'm, we're performing on this stage. No, we, we, there's a sense but in which an we authentic are authentic performance. I, I like to think so, you know. So these are views that I would, I would repeat if I were in my pajamas at home. That's, I, I really believe that. Same. But I think there's a sense in which Twitter is about, you know, you're, you're kind of performing, mm -hmm. and and. And I think that there are consequences to that. You know, you're, you're writing about people who are real human beings. And it just, I don't know. I just think that it's not so much that I'm saying people shouldn't be held accountable because they should be. But I think maybe it's how are we doing the holding? Mm. Mm. Yeah. How are we? That's a gem, okay? So for the mm. people at home and in the audience, we just heard a gem. <laughs> We're going to have some Q&A from the audience, so I want folks to get their questions ready. As you're getting your questions ready, I would like to remind you we're doing questions, not comments, that's a little quiz, okay? So have your question ready, <laughs> and we will answer your question. And while we're finding people, um, think very long and hard about those, I, I would be remiss if I did not ask you. I want to ask you two questions, but I'll save one for the very, very end after the questions. But I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about the um, the ordeal and epidemic, I will call it, of banning books in the United States of America currently, particularly books written about black people, particularly books written about the very real history yeah. uh, in our country. And I just, you know, think the world would love your, your view on that. <laughs> right. So, so here's my view on it is there's something that often one hears from um, the political right in this country, which is facts don't care about your feelings. I think this is where that applies. No, honestly, I think this is what everyone who 
it's the fact. The fa I mean, I quite frankly think that African American history, and I'm being specific when I say that because there's black, which is a, you know, I'm black, I'm mm -hmm. not African American, you're black, you're African American. Facts. Right? And I think that African American history is actually terribly under, under known, under taught, um, simplified, overly simplified in ways that I think are dangerous. So, and I'll say, and what I mean by that is, um, so this is Black History Month, and you know, I, I feel conflicted about that because I think every month should be Black History Month. Um, but, but at the same time, I kind of understand that this is something that was done because of all, you know, the centuries of sort of neglect and silencing of, of Black stories. But the reason that I worry about it is that it kind of becomes this month about Martin Luther King. And I think he obviously was wonderful, but there's so much more. Mm -hmm. There's so much more. And I, I sometimes feel that if we actually taught the, the story of African-Americans in this country, then there's so much about contemporary discourse that would be better. So, so the subject of reparations, for example. So I am completely, I think that reparations should be mainstream and should not be in any way a niche subject. And by the way, when I say that, I mean reparations for African-Americans. I don't mean me. You know, I came from Nigeria. And by that, so my point is, there, is, there is a history in this country in which people who were enslaved and the people who they gave birth to and the people those people gave birth to, we inherit trauma, human beings inherit trauma. So not just the psychological trauma, but you have a country. I mean, you know, honestly, when I started reading about African-American history, I just thought, my God. So I live in Maryland. It's traumatic. It's traumatic. That's my American yeah, home. 20 years ago, they were, they, were, they were draining swimming pools in Maryland so that black families would not swim. I'm not talking about 1940, right? So there's, uh, anyway, so we know about redlining, we know about, so I, I, I feel as though facts don't care about your feelings. Every American should know the facts of what happened and it should be familiar and it should go beyond Martin Luther King. I remember when I first read, this is before the movie, The Green Book came out. So I, I'd read about it and I was talking to a friend of mine who's African-American and I, and I assumed she knew. So I was like, oh my goodness, you know, even just this idea of The Green Book. She's like, what's that? Mm -hmm. It's not a mainstream. Do folks know what she, The Green Book is? She, ha the she has, a, ma but she has a master's degree. Mm -hmm. And it's not so that my point is, it's not a failure on her part. It's a failure on an, on an education system that diminishes, simplifies, flattens the African-American story. Because, because to do that, and this, by the way, I'm, I'm reading this book by, um, uh, I'm, oh, I'm going to blank on his name. He's a, he's a professor at um, NYU. Uh, but, but this is his idea which, where he says that this kind of simplifying and almost not erasing, but sort of minimizing the reality of African-American history is because to do that, it, it's almost as though you have to do that. Otherwise you challenge the larger narrative of America, right? If you tell the full story, then you challenge this sort of, you know, very rosy. Oh yeah, yeah. Story of you America. tell people the Civil War is about slavery yeah. and there might be an uprising in a classroom yeah. somewhere in America, even but, though it was. Yeah, it was but, about the economy as well, the economic, engine that was slavery and people took up arms against this government because they believed they had the right to own people Simple. that looked like yeah. us. So when they say it's about states' rights, yes, but states' rights to do what? And the thing is, I think, again, facts don't care about your feelings. We should teach people the facts. And this kind of book banning and this kind of trumped up hysteria about something called CRT that nobody knows what the bloody hell it is anyway. Um, it, it's just, I think, again, proof that this is a country that hasn't reckoned with its history and with its present in terms of its relationships with its black people. That's what I think about this country, right? I, I think that there's still so much that hasn't been done. And, and every day, you know, we can sit on a stage like this and say, we need to have conversations about race. And I guess we do, but really what we need to do is, I'm interested in what's in the curriculum of high schools and middle schools, what's being taught, right? And can we make it maybe a bit more narrative? There's a lovely line that I like to repeat from Robert Lowell's poem where, why not just say what happened? Like I want, like, you know, do kids, you know, kids should, every educated adult in this country should be very familiar, not just with 
slavery mm -hmm. and plantations and Martin Luther King, but redlining and and um, you know all so just sort of having and Carter G. Woodson who. Yes created Black yes. History Month, Pi yes. well, Negro History Week, which turned into Black History Month, but I digress, but very important. There is, yeah. what you're saying is there's nuance, again, this yes. philosophy, if you will, yeah. and it is not currently there in this discourse. And it's, it's affecting what's happening today. That's mm -hmm. the reason it bothers me. I mean, obviously I think history is good for its own sake, but we should also talk about how, how the, you know, the present is about the past. Do you think any one of your books will ever make it to this uh, this this polarized place where they want to ban it from the schools? <laughs> I, I feel like if I was a writer, that I, I wrote a book, but I don't consider myself a writer. But if I was a writer and I wrote about real stories, the question I would ask myself before I wrote my next book is, will they want to ban this? Because if so, this is the New York Times bestseller. <laughs> Okay, we're gonna take some questions from the audience. Where are my people with, okay. So we have Simon and Victor here and uh, we're gonna take our first question right over here. Sure. And Victor is gonna hold oh, the sorry. microphone, yeah? Sorry, I missed that. Um, it's an honor to ask this question. Thank you so much for your comments. Um, I was a little bit challenged by your statement about, you know, of course we live in a very polarized and radicalized society. And of course, we also live in an environment where people are trying to suppress history. So how do we rectify the two? We also live in an environment where people are actively trying to restrict women's rights and their ability to control their own bodies. So how do we bridge that divide and have a more equal line of thinking when there are serious threats to basic rights? Thanks. Oh, I'm, I'm not, I think, I hope I haven't been misunderstood. So in talking about um, we're really polarized and that's terrible, doesn't mean that I don't think, for example, that it is, um, you know, sort of unforgivably outrageous that in this country we are, in fact, still talking about a woman's right to do what she wants with her body. I mean, the, so in, again, I'm going back to the Philip Roth and the racist novel. So I, I draw my line. That the, so I think, for example, that I'm, I'm very, um, I'm a believer in dialogue. And I guess I've always been, I, maybe it's the way I was raised, I don't know. But, but at the same time, one draws a line because there's some people that there's just no point talking to them. So for me, as, as a woman who spends half my time here and half my time in Nigeria, I'm always struck by how um, misogyny is alive and well in both places. Um, in America, it's often sort of glossed over and people say, well, you know, it's not that bad. Women, you know, a woman was nearly president, so it's okay. But that's not true. Um, in Nigeria, it's much more overt. So people were saying to me, oh, but a woman cannot be governor of your state because she's a woman. How can a woman be governor? Um, for me, both are equally terrible, but I worry that in this country, because it's glossed over and because the language around it is often, you know, because often in this country, people don't call things what they are. So that worries me. And so there's certain people that I just won't, there's no point talking to them about you know, so in, this, in, this, in this instance, um, women's rights. But at the same time, I think that it's possible to change people's minds. So, you know, I, I, I for example, have a few nice stories about men in Nigeria that I have, I think, um, gotten to maybe start to see women as human, which is, you know, remarkable. Um, and I say that and we laugh, but really, because I think, for example, and, and I'm a person, you know, I, People who are opposed to, to um, abortion on religious grounds or whatever, I respect that as long as it's for them, right? I really respect that. But I think that for a person to impose that on anybody, you cannot think of a woman as a full human being and believe that you can impose on her a forced birth. I just think you, you do not see women as human if you believe that, right? So, so, I mean, it's kind of funny to say, oh, I got some mental... But, but I think fundamentally that's what it is if you cannot think of a woman as a full human being with all of her complex, you know, and this idea that women are not good, we should get over that women are human, because I think that's also a problem where we have such high expectations. You know, I remember once a woman who was a politician in Nigeria had stolen money, which is what politicians, politicians in Nigeria do. And, and then she got such bad press. And someone said, but how can a woman steal all that money? You know, it's this idea, you know, you're a woman, therefore, you're so... Oh, oh, I have experienced it, okay? Not the women stealing money, but somehow they just seem to write about the women in politics just a little bit different. Yeah. They seem so to talk about her just a little bit yeah. different on TV. I don't yeah. know. I mean, you know, if we had a, a vice president who was a man, would people be concerned about, 
all the leadership style and the staff are squabbling. I mean, is she an auntie who's supposed to make sure everyone kisses and makes up, or is she a vice president? I mean, I mean, one could argue it's not like, you know, she's not going on very important diplomatic missions and yeah. doing real work. I don't right. know. I don't There's know. nothing else to talk about than, you know, how is she housekeeping? That's really what this is. Honestly. I think it's a very gendered and just very unacceptable. But anyway, so, yeah. Thank you for your question, by the way. <laughs> We're going to take our next question from the back. And while we're getting the microphone up back there, yes, yes, we'll take, yep. We'll take our, we'll bring a microphone to you. Um, and while we're getting it back there, uh, a really important question I want to get you on the record on. Who has the better jollof, Ghana <laughs> or Nigeria? I have witnessed this ideological debate many times. All right. If there are any Ghanaians here, you all just better sit down and keep quiet. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right, so I will hey. be having a meeting with the Ghanaian caucus after this. You all come see me. I will tell your story. Look, look, you know, we love Ghana. Ghana is our little brother. Um, uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, my, na my name is Cammy Butt, and uh, I live in Ghetto, part of Washington, D.C. You ladies talk about January 6th, are the people who came to demonstrate in the uh, support of Trump. Uh, when you analyze the life of these people. These are very patriotic people. They are the one who fight for America. And if you analyze their life, they are not economically better than lower and middle class African American. So do you have any empathy or sympathy for these people that they think that this country is overtaken by people like myself and yourself, and they are looking for a cause, and they thought this was a good cause and they came to Washington DC. And uh, I mean, do you see as a human being something good in these people's? Thanks. Let me first say thank you for your question. Just adjust here. <laughs> so I think the facts are important. We talk about the facts. I think we have talked about the facts. And the facts are that, and I wanna caveat this conversation with, I was on Capitol Hill on January 6th. It was reported that the vice president was there. I was with her. We were on the Hill, and then we were evacuated. And we all luckily got to be able to, I went home, the vice president went to an undisclosed secure location, then the vice president-elect, and I watched it unfold on television. What happened on January 6th, ladies and gentlemen, to be very clear, is that people came to the Capitol in Washington, DC, to disrupt a process that ensured the peaceful transition of power in the United States of America, fueled by something we have so eloquently, okay, and so glibly called the big lie. Well, the big lie is the belief that President Biden and Vice President Harris are not the duly elected president and vice president of this country. The big lie says that something went down with the voting machines. The big lie says that there were actually some extra votes somewhere that nobody counted that made Donald Trump actually the next president or the re-elected president of the United States of America and the peep and that big lie was pushed on television channels, in newspapers, on social media, in communities across the country, in little chats like Reddit, and people believed it. So they organized and they came to the Capitol on January 6th with the sole goal to disrupt the certifying of electors to disrupt the peaceful transition of power in the United States of America. They came to the Capitol to disrupt democracy, to stop what people all across this country went out and voted for, to, to invalidate their work. So the people that came to the Capitol that essentially took up arms against the government, I don't know, I think we've heard this before. Those people, those people were insurrectionists. Those people came to bring disruption. Those people are not people that believed in democracy. And what strikes me so much about that day is that largely the people at the Capitol, they went home. They went home into communities across this country. They went back to sit on school boards and they went back to PTA meetings and they went back to police departments and they went back to state legislative offices. They went back to offices and they went back to businesses. So I have no empathy for people that took up arms against the government in hopes of disrupting the peaceful transition of power because they believe they lie. 
That's how I feel. I don't know if you have thoughts. Bravo. <laughs> no, I can't possibly, I mean, I, what, what can I add to that? But I, but I want to know, because I, I do want to clarify your question. So are you asking if we have empathy for what they did or empathy for who they are? Yeah. Yeah, I have depression too, but I, I'm not going to. So, know. I mean, you should show some empathy for those people <laughs> if you do have depression. But I'll tell you why, because I think we also, I mean, and this maybe sounds a bit religious, but we have free will. I mean, isn't that sort of this idea that you make choices? So, um, and, and when we talk, I think in this country, there's, a, there's an expectation that there are certain groups um, whose uh, grievances have more value than the grievances of other groups. So when, when we talk about the sort of white male angst, um, a certain kind of, um, and, and in, in this country, they call it white working class. Actually, for, for a long time, they called it the working class, as though somehow black people and brown people also don't belong to the working class. But the white working class has this, there's, you know, the angst, I think, is real. Um, and there's a sense in which I could write a character. And, and I think I could make him sympathetic because there's a sense in which you've grown up in a world where there's, there's also an entitlement at the core of that feeling because you've grown up in a world where you're supposed to be at the center and suddenly you see that you're no longer kind of in the center, even though you really you are still, but anyway. Um, and, and, and so that, that really shifts the way you, you feel. So I think that that kind of white male working class angst is a real thing that you know you're you're in towns that used to produce and make things and now those towns are shuttered um and and all of those things right so in a human sense i understand that and feel empathy what i do not feel empathy for and never will are the choices that then are made because of that because you know a lot of those people could have chosen to stay home and find democratic ways to air their views, right? And these are the same people who, by the way, and I say this as an African, who if this kind of thing happened in Nigeria, they would say, oh my God, uncivilized Africans. But, but, they, but they just did it. So it's not as if they don't know that it's not right. So I, it's, it's difficult for me, especially in reading stories about people who were caught up in there, just the terror of it, right? Um, it's difficult for me to have any empathy. I think it was a very ugly thing, and I think it was very inhumane. So, um, I yeah. think we have time. We'll do one. We'll try to take maybe two. We'll take one on this side, and then I'm trying to be democratic, so we'll take one from the middle. So, Simon, make it happen. I don't know. Okay, sorry. Thank you. You know, about saving the democracy, um, you know, and, and trying to see uh, what practical steps can we... Can you suggest? I mean, I'm, I'm thinking uh, and also talking about the cancel culture. I mean, even the New York Times, for example, I was one of these, the head of a university recently was, had fallen, fallen in love with one of his staff and had to, was forced to resign his position. That's fine. But the New York Times published the, a link to all of the emails between them, you know, so, and the University of Michigan published all of those emails. This is a consensual relationship. I, I just thought, what has happened to the New York Times in terms of its standards of, of judgment? I'm a journalist by training. I, I, I grew up in a, earlier with an earlier sort of ideal vision about the New York Times and other papers, which has, which has been sullied somewhat. I'm also a writer, so I understand but I think that I'm living also in a declining democracy. And I want to know your opinion about the role of the media, both on the liberal side and the right wing, in that decline. And also whether there are some solutions besides bringing the book back somehow in a big way into people's <laughs> lives. That you That's the only solution. <laughs> no, I think, Simone, I think Simone is better at answering that, the, the, the practical things. Because, um, you, know, you know, I just waffle on. But, but I do want to say, I don't know the story that you mentioned, um, 
But I'm so sorry, the only thing I could think about was, oh, the love letters they wrote were published, I want to go read them. <laughs> That's terrible, right? That's really terrible. I'm, because I'm a writer, I'm always looking for material, and just the idea of reading other people's love story, love letters, I'm like, yes! But um, I, I really don't know. I don't know the. the I don't know that. I don't know. I'm not. I. I, I don't know what. what We're going to see is. this. This is going to be a yeah. scene in an upcoming book. And just remember <laughs> that it happened here, ladies <laughs> and gentlemen. It might be, but but um, I kind of share your um. I, you know, so in Nigeria, the New York Times was a thing to look up to. I still think it's a good paper in many ways. I think the book section is very good. Um. Um. But I kind of, you know, there are times when, again, I think it, I don't think it's a New York Times issue. I think it's a it's an American political discourse issue where sometimes I read a piece in the New York Times, and honestly, at the end, I'm like, you still haven't told me what happened. Like, I still don't know what happened. There is an the, and, and I sense this sort of being overly careful. Sometimes the sentences, I read them two times, I'm like, this is not even actually a good sentence. And that's because you're trying to contort yourself. It's almost as though they're written thinking about who can sue us, who can get offended, who can... And in the end, I'm like, what the hell happened? So, and I'm not sure that it's that the New York Times is sort of evil, or I think that they're responding to a reality in America. And I don't know what the answer is. I think maybe do we need a few brave people who will sort of, you know, stand up and I don't know, I don't know. But Simone can tell us what we can do to restore <laughs> democracy. <laughs> Whatever I, she tells us to do, I will do. I too don't, I mean, look, I think the, the, the way to ensure democracy thrives is to participate in it. And there are various ways to participate. And mm -hmm. you as a writer are participating in democracy every day by writing and putting your thoughts on a page. Uh, you, sir, you're trained in journalism. Journalists are a very important part of democracy, a free, fair, and open press. And, you know, in my, in my previous life, I used to battle with the journalists all the time. I saw lots of headlines and stories I didn't like, but I respected the fact that they had the opportunity to, to write that and to say and to come up with a perspective because every journalist has a perspective. If they tell you they don't, they're not telling the truth. They all have a perspective, their theory of the case. And I respect the fact and relish and enjoy the fact that in the United States of America, uh, the, the fourth, and we talk about the three pillars of, of, of the institutions of our democracy. Well, the fourth pillar is the free press. So the best way to continue, for democracy continue, to continue to thrive is for us to participate in it. And yes, the media has a responsibility there to keep the bar high and substantive yeah, yeah. and to tell the truth. And that is why I'm excited about um, the next thing that I'm doing because I think that it is extremely important that she's going to be on MSNBC, <laughs> so everyone has to watch. Thank I'll you. be watching. Yeah, thank you. Thank, we're oh, going totally to do watching. this again totally, on TV. Totally, totally be watching. Totally. But it is really, it's really important that people ask real questions, that they yeah. have the opportunity to hear from real people, and that they hear a bevy of perspectives. I was watching television the other day, and I saw the ambassador on, and. Uh, he, yes, 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 it was you, okay, asking, answering very hard-hitting and pressing questions from Andrea Mitchell about President Macron and France and Ukraine and what's happening with Russia and uh, President Macron's upcoming meeting, and I smiled as I saw him on television because I think that it is so important that Every audience, but particularly people here in the United States of America, have the opportunity and the ability to hear from mm. the French ambassador in his own words so that they're not confused about what is happening. You don't, the, the media is a very powerful tool yeah. to just present information to people across the world. And I, I love seeing you on TV the other day, and I thought it was, a, it was democracy in action, okay? <laughs> So I know we are a little over time. Uh, we are going to go one more. Okay. We are going to call. Okay. Maybe two more. more. I'll, okay. I'll keep them really short. Okay. Just, we're going to go here. And then we'll go to the woman with the camera. And then we'll go to you right there, sir, in the, in the uh, red burgundy. Nice situation. <laughs> I like his shirt. Yes. <laughs> yes. Hi. I'm very honored to be able to ask you this question. I read Americana when I just arrived in the U.S., and I felt so touched as an immigrant. And when I make, I, I had like a full discourse, but I'm going to go to the prompt. I felt a bit uneasy about the white person feeling so aligned with an experience of a black person coming to America. And my question is, do you think that's white fragility? 
no. I think you're just human and you're... you're... So one of the things that I, I... So I feel like, again, I wish that the conversation around race in this country would maybe focus... I would like us to learn more about what happened to black people in this country instead of spending a lot of time on theories that, quite frankly, I don't know. I mean, why would you feel uneasy um, as a human being reading a book that you identified with the feelings of another human being? It's somehow because we've kind of created this narrative that um, if you're white, you cannot possibly ever understand what a black person is going through. There are many things that I think white people struggle to get, honestly. However, I do think that there's a layer of us that is human, and that's what literature does. I don't think, I think, I don't think one should feel uneasy. I read Russian books when I was growing up. I didn't know how to pronounce the names properly, but I understood what they were feeling. And I don't think that if you asked um, Tolstoy or Dostoevsky whether when he was writing, he was thinking about this you know, girl in small town university in Nigeria, whether she would get him. I'm sure he probably thought monkeys in Africa can read, maybe. I mean, I shouldn't ascribe racist to, because I don't actually have any evidence of that, but you know, I mean, I don't think Russia at the time of Tolstoy was necessarily a very black friendly place. Actually, it's not a black friendly place today. But anyway. Um, another speech, true, another, another conversation. Another it's conversation. true, though, it's true. I think, you know, it's true. But anyway. Um, so, so no, I think, you know, literature is, literature is the last thing we have to, to connect us and to remind us, which is why I often say people should read. Um, I think many, I think, so, okay, my, this is my last rant, and I did say I would keep it short, but, so, I, a friend of mine who's Dutch, he once told me, um, Shortly after Michelle Obama's memoir was published, he said to me, and because he knows that I'm a sort of, you know, huge Michelle Obama lover, um, so he said to me, oh, I bought her book for all of my women friends. And so I'm like, but, but why all your, why didn't you buy the book for your men friends? And this is a guy who's a really good guy, you know, he's progressive, he probably would call himself feminist if you asked him. But, but in his mind, women read women, right? Women's stories are for women. So this memoir written by a woman, of course, women should read it. And that really bothers me. And we know from studies that women read women, while men read, women read women and men. Men read men. I, one of my things is I would love to start this campaign of men read women. I would also like to do it for race. I think more white people really should see black literature, not just as black literature, but as literature. Right, so I remember once going to, um, no, but it's true because sometimes, you know, you, you've, I, I know white people who, again, and, and, and I say this because it's not about people being bad people. You know, these are people who are progressive, well-meaning, but, but they pick up a book and they'll say something like, I read James Baldwin. And, and it's almost like medicine, right? It's, they, they took their medicine, they took their vitamins. <laughs> But it should be, you should read it in the same way as one would read, you know, The Grapes of Wrath or something. I mean, we, so, so I think black literature should be literature. I mean, I think, I think when young white parents go to a bookstore, I think it should be as important to them as it is to me to find children's books that are diverse. Because, you know, I remember once going to a store and saying to this, um, the woman at the store, you know, I want books for kids that don't just have, you know, rabbits and, and, and things in them, which are good, but also just have people of color. And actually, to be very honest, I said very specifically black people. Because, you know, again, and we can unpack that, that idea of people of color is useful in many ways. In other ways, it's not, because I think it shields the particular needs of different groups, right? I think that the racism Asians experience has a very different texture from the racism that Hispanic Americans experience. And that sometimes when we lump everyone in, it just becomes this thing where everybody who's not white has one experience, which is not true. But anyway, so my point is, and what was my point? <laughs> Your point is that you, madam, can absolutely identify yeah. with the characters in <laughs> Chimamanda's book because at the root of this all, we are all human. It's really my job yeah. to synthesize things. You know, I do that very well. Okay, Thank we're going to take the last... Okay, okay, okay. We're going to take your question, your question. Ask them both at the same time. What is your question? And then I'm going to take or your I question. I promise I will answer in two sentences. 
what about hello. the burgundy? Hello. Uh, it's nice to meet you, Chimamanda, finally. Uh, actually, I read, uh, the first book I read was uh, Purple Hibiscus. Then I read Americana. I recommend it to a lot of uh, uh, South Sudanese people. I'm from South Sudan. So I get the honor, I get a training with Marita Golden in 2016 for mm-hmm. Mumar writing. Mm-hmm. And then I asked her, like, because she was telling me about your first book, how can I meet Chimamanda? Because I have a lot of challenges in my writing. Uh, and I remember also you were telling the story that when you apply to come to the U.S. for the university, you have a problem with your writing. So I had the same problem uh, still with my writing. And she was asking me, maybe you, you, you have the ability to write fiction. But if you met Chimamanda, maybe she's the right one who will advise you. So I, <laughs> oh, well, yeah. this is good. So I want to know exactly uh, the advice that you give me because now I'm in the U.S. I have all this experience and emotion surrounded by me, and I also have memories from back home and I'm political mm-hmm. transformation. I want to know how I can transfer that to a script. Like, how do you did it at that time? You you want to write a script or you want to write I, a novel? I want to write a novel, okay. but I want to know exactly. What encouraged you? What <laughs> okay, I think y'all need to get each other's emails. I love this. She was <laughs> like, I am going to ask about my writing because I have a writer's block. She's here. I need to do this. First of all, round of applause what? for you because yeah, this... what's up next? Thank you. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Okay, I want you to answer her question, but I also think you, yeah. you might need to set advice for younger yes. people like I think us what also. I would just say, it's quite, I would just say you need to write it. Because I'm a bilingual, uh, English wasn't my first language. Yes. And then I have to go and study. Yeah, but I can understand you, which means you can write it. So you're speaking English. <laughs> I mean, this idea somehow that we have to be perfect before we start something mm-hmm. is not helpful. Okay. Just start it. And Auntie Marita, I love Marita Golden. If you were in her in her workshop, I think that that's you've done it. So now you need to sit down and write. Okay. It's going to take you five years, maybe, right? Um, find somebody who loves you and who's honest with you and who can read, mm-hmm. and let that person read bits of what you write. And and the reason I say this is honest with you. They'll tell you if it's rubbish. Loves you, they will say it in a way that protects your heart, you know, um, and can read. You know, for obvious reasons. But honestly, Um, we need so stories. So I'm very, very interested in South Sudan. I was talking to somebody who's who's Sudanese, but to sort of, you know, the other Sudan, not not yours. Um, And I was so curious about what life is like now, because I'm you know what? I feel disappointed because I felt this kind of yes to South Sudan because I was like, yes. ma'am, And then, you know, all of this infighting and I've read it a bit and it's just so I'm, I'm really curious about what life is like for people like Mm -hmm. the textured lives of people so i already have an idea for your novel so you have some so part of it will be set in south sudan and then you can then have the story of a person who comes to the u.s because i was wondering where did she find all this experience when she write americana i asked this question for a lot of people here in the u.s they said she's nigerian so she, she's good in experiencing everything. <laughs> so I think all of us Africans, we are good also in experiencing things. Thank you. Thank you. Oh my goodness, yes. Good luck to you. Not this real life writing workshop <laughs> encouragement right here at the embassy. Okay, our last question is going to go to the gentleman in the very nice shirt right over here, young sir. And we are giving you the last question, so I'm going to just say it better be good. It's Black History Month. Don't let us down. What? No <laughs> pressure. No pressure. Wait, wait. Okay, so first of all, thank you again for this conversation. It was really brilliant, really engaging. Um, so earlier you mentioned CRT, um, which is critical race theory. If you guys don't know what that is, I hope you look it up as soon as you go home because it's really important. Um, and this also relates to the fact that you talked about earlier about truth telling and the fact that history doesn't seem to be told in the way that it should be. Um, so knowing the fact that history is not only about the facts that occurred, but the way that these archives are interpreted in the first place. And because a lot of the histories of people of color and black people in this nation simply were not documented, what do you think is your role as a storyteller in creating these kind of truths that we talk about now and how people maybe down the line will view the current moment that we see and see your book potentially at the archive to talk about the society, the society that we live in today? Such a great, cl- cl- clap, clap, please clap. Okay, you did not let us down. Miss Chimamanda. Tell us. This is a great question to end on. Tell us. I don't know. (laughs) I I think that's a good answer to end on. No. Um, You know what? But by the way, so I want to... um, Yes, when you say that critical race theory is important, I suppose it is. 
Personally, I'm not a keen fan of theory in general, and I don't know, you know, I'm sure the academics here and you do wonderful work and you, is that word valid that young people use on social media? You are valid. But, and I'll tell you why, when it comes to history in particular, and also to women's studies, I'm not a keen fan of theory. I'm much more interested. And again, of course, I'm biased. I come with my biases. I'm a writer. I'm a storyteller. I'm interested in story. I'm interested in narrative. I think that history serves us better when we have a more narrative focus. So yes, of course, the interpretation matters. But again, back to that line from the Lowell poem, why not just say what happened? I think maybe it's a good thing to start with the narrative approach, especially when people are younger. Um, and increasingly, I think that you know, literature can play a role. So I um, would love to see, I also think that there, I mean, African-American stories, there's been a bit of, a, of an improvement, but in general, it's not, it hasn't, it's not, it's not norm. It's still almost niche in this country in a way that it shouldn't be. Um, so I, I guess, I guess my, my, my view is we just need to tell the stories of what happened. And, and I also think it would be, because people don't read, and it's terrible, but just they don't. And so maybe we need to have more, I don't know, mini series. So I'm watching, <laughs> I'm watching um, actually the ambassador might be interested in this. Do you know, there's a, there's a series on, on Amazon Prime that's called The French Village. Ah, I think it's fantastic. So it's about, you know, it's set during the, the Second World War in the small French village. And I'm watching it because I'm really interested in that period. But also I'm thinking this is the kind of thing that should be done for African-American history. And I don't mean slave narratives. I mean kind of a mini series from maybe Isabel Wilkerson's book um, about the Great Migration. And so for the people who will not read that magnificent book, and everybody really should, but you know, then they can watch it and, and you watch it and you come away having a sense of what it is like to have been a black person in this country um, in a way that is textured so that when somebody on TV on Fox News is saying, oh, they want reparations, that's crazy. Actually, you're saying it's not that crazy because I know the history. So that's kind of my, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Do you teach CRT? Uh, aha, so you, that, that's what you should do then. Tell the stories. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Please give a huge round of applause to Chibamanda and Gozi Adichea. We love you. Thank you so much. We love you so much. This was a great conversation. A huge round of applause for Ambassador ATN and the French Embassy for curating this lovely space. And a bigger round of applause for all of you. Thank you. And for me, my name is Simone D. Sanders. You can watch me on MSNBC and The Choice come this spring. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador.